All right, tonight's topic. My favorite topic is keys to a happy marriage. Many people will say keys to a happy marriage. Uh, the Bible, what you know, what does that got to do with? Mar what does the Bible have to do with marriage? What does Christianity have to do with marriage? Well, I think the the family and the home is the greatest. The greatest lessons can be learned there about the character of God than any place else. Those relationships, the love for a mother to a uh, to a child, the love of a father to a child or wife to a husband or, or, or whatever combination you want to use are things that teach us and help us to know how much our Heavenly Father loves us. So what does the Bible have to offer? Well, remember that uh, God created uh, the institution of marriage. God created um, uh, the family. And so Reason it would stand to reason that he would give us uh, a, an operator's manual, or at least some some very good advice or some instructions, so that we could make it work. Because if this is something that he wants, if this is something that he approves of, even to the extent where the Bible tells us that when a man and a woman are joined together in marriage, that so sacred is that covenant that God sees those people as one flesh, as one person. And that is uh, bandied around a bit, but you, if you really stop and, and try to uh, think about that for a while and the implications and what that means, it's really quite astounding. And, and I'm not surprised because I have um, come to understand a little bit about what that means because what God has done by joining the masculine male and the feminine female together into one person, it, it makes them a, a, a more complete person. It makes them a whole unit. I have told the story in past Bible studies that uh, I, and of course, I enjoy, like many men, tools and, and race cars and jets and equipment and, and all of these great things, these technological things that are, that are so uh, interesting to men. But I overlooked a lot of the natural beauty of the world. The wildflowers, the poppies growing beside the road, you know, the smell of the grass uh, after a rainstorm. Uh, all, you know, these things that my, my wife is very connected to. And I've been able to see through her eyes and see the world very differently. She has brought that appreciation for the things that I once passed over to me. And now I feel like I'm a more complete person, that I enjoy those things much more. So... Coming together, the male, the masculine, and the feminine do, in my opinion, and I think I could, I could, I think I have biblical, the Bible to stand on with this. Uh, when I say it makes us a more a complete person, a more godlike, more godlike person. Yeah, I do. So we'll be following the study guide tonight from the Amazing Facts website and how it works for you guys who are new subscribers. I do not uh, have the ability to monitor monitor the chat here to the right uh, while I'm doing the Bible study. My I'm, I, I have to kind of focus and stay on task, or I'll or we'll just go on and on all night. So if you have a question or a comment, I do ask that you just save it to the end. And if I'm not getting to it, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and um, just keep asking it. I am limited uh, for time tonight because it's the Fresh Peas birthday and we're going over there to her birthday party as soon as I get done with the Bible study. So I'll probably be out of here in about 45 minutes. Um, so we'll have to kind of hustle through it and there won't be a lot of time for questions, but we'll do the best we can. All right, so let's get into it. The first, well, we'll just go into the Bible study. There's a lot of instructions here. What we're going to usually the study guide asks questions and we let the Bible to answer the questions. But there's a lot of statements that will be made because what it is is there are certain things that the Bible tells us we should do as newlyweds or as, as husbands and wives uh, that will help to ensure we have a successful marriage. And the first one here is for us to establish our own private home. The Bible says, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be of one flesh. So why is this so important? I have heard uh, many people say, 
um, young married people that maybe didn't have quite enough money to establish their own home when they got married, they'll say, well, we're going to move in with my with my parents and live in their basement, or I'm gonna, we're going to move in with my wife's parents and live in their spare bedroom so we can save some money to get our own home. What the Bible's telling us is that's a very bad idea because as nice as we are and as nice as our parents are, when you come together with a wife or a husband and living together for the first time, things there's a lot of getting used to. There's a lot of things that you just never thought of when you were going through the courtship process. You didn't realize that, that your wife had a particular way of cooking eggs. You didn't realize that your husband had a particular way he liked his shirts hung up. All of these things are not big issues and they just they can easily be ironed out with patience and understanding. However, they do bring stress to the relationship. And when you take that, you couple all of that, all of those learning um, difficulties and you add the competitiveness of a mother-in-law or a fa or, or a, a father-in-law that may be approving maybe somewhat disapproving and you're in their house and you bring your new wife into the house with your parents and she has to compete with your mother you are asking for a trouble the Bible is very clear that we need to establish our own home. It would be better for us to live in a one-room apartment that we could call our own than to move in uh, to a family member's house. And, and uh, I couldn't agree more. Number two, the Bible instructs us that we should continue our courtship. The Bible says, above all, hold unfailing your love for one another, since love covers a multitude of sins. And the Bible says her husband praises her. And the Bible says, she that is married careth how she may please her husband. And finally, the Bible says, be kindly affectionate to one another in honor, preferring one over another. And I think that that's really great advice. What the Bible's telling us is, remember how you felt and, and how you acted when you were first dating your wife? Remember that there wasn't anything you wouldn't have done, any sacrifice. You would have, you would have walked... How was it they used to say, I'd walk a mile for a camel? You would have walked a mile or 10 or 20 miles um, to give her a cold glass of water if that's what she wanted. We all felt that way. I don't think that it's possible to maintain that, that passion and that fire and that, and that excitement that you have in a new relationship. How could you? You would never be able to work. You would never be able to sleep. It would run you. It would basically wear you down. It's a very powerful exciting emotional time and it's rightfully so and it's a wonderful time however the idea i think in modern media and books and literature is would tell us that if we are not experiencing that for 10 20 50 years then there's something wrong with our marriage well that's just nonsense there's a season for everything there's a time for that that when it, when that is all well and good and, and proper and there's a time where you enter into a different phase of love Something that's more, that is not that raging wildfire ripping through the grass, but more of a slower burn um, where love and trust and admiration and affection are, are built. And so just because you don't feel that initial rush of excitement and passion that you once did does not mean that you're not in love with your mate or that you're in a marriage that isn't, that isn't successful. Those things change. There's a time for that, and then there's a time to move on to other things. You have to get bus busy about the business of raising a family and, and building a home and, and building a life. And that passion and that excitement of a first young relationship would, be, would, would not allow you to do that. You would be too distracted. But it is important to continue our courtship. Number three, remember that God joined you together in marriage. The Bible says, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife. Wherefore they are no more twain, or no more two, but one, one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man put asunder. So what God is telling us right here is he's really emphasizing the importance of this covenant. We think that if we jump into bed with a woman before we're married, and a one night stand, whatever you want to call it, that that is that there's no uh, lasting damage to that. We can move on, and that's just what we do, and it's no different than um, going in and, and eating dinner. It's just something we did, and the next day it's forgotten, it's over with. 
That's not true. There is a bond that is made between people when they come together in that way, come together intimately, that is not easily broken. And yes, you may find yourself, your young guys, going through woman after woman after woman every weekend, and what you're ultimately doing to yourself is you're damaging yourself and you're taking away your ability to truly love a woman. Uh, I, I would put it as it, you are putting scars on your heart, hardening yourself so you don't have that tender, loving heart. You don't have that ability to look upon a woman like you would had, had she been the only one that you would have ever been intimate with. And, and you might say this is a Victorian and an old-fashioned idea, but it's a simple truth. Uh, it just it, it's regard we're we're bombarded that health is that sex is a healthy natural thing and it's something that that uh, there's nothing wrong with it there's no effects to it and it's just not true there's a lot of psychological pain and damage that comes from that let alone all the physical dangers that could come out of it and that's the advice that I would give to young guys you know think hard about that make sure that you you understand that you are damaging yourself you're damaging that poor girl uh, by doing that. And um, I, I, I learned that mistake uh, m myself. So, I mean, I'm not, not saying I'm better than you about it. I'm just saying that that's just the way, the way it is. And God's warning us about that. Number four, guard your thoughts. Don't let your senses trap you. The Bible says, for as he thinketh, as he thinks in his heart, so he is. And the Bible says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And the Bible says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. And the Bible says, whatsoever things are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, and of good report, think on these things. Yes, we all know that. Even people that, uh, motivational speakers, people that work with, uh, with, with folks to try to get them um, to, to get their lives picked up and their lives back on track will tell you, and we all know it, as you think, there so you go. So if you start thinking about something, eventually it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I have, I, I tell the story, it's happened to all of us. I think men can really relate to this. You may be perfectly content with your old truck and everything is good and, and, and you just enjoy it and you have no need of a new truck. Then all of a sudden something will happen and you will make the decision subconsciously maybe that that old junker has got to go and I need to get a new truck. So now every time you look at that truck, you're looking at it through a jaded eye, a jaundiced eye. You're looking at it thinking, yep, every time it's going to break down on me. It's going to end up, you know, it's going to, it's going to nickel and dime me to death. It's going to be, uh, you know, oh man, what if the transmission goes out? You know, I, I need to really get rid of that truck. I need to get rid of it. And therefore you stop maintaining it. You stop washing it and you have your eyes off of that onto something better. Same truck, same situation, but you've made the decision in your mind that you wanted a new truck and the justification machine starts kicking into overdrive. I know that's a bit of a simplistic um, analogy, but it is the same way with your wife. If you start looking at her and thinking, you know what, I wish she did this, this something this way, or I wish she wouldn't say that, or, or, or this little thing about, about her annoys me. Those little things, you start collecting them and thinking upon them, pretty soon they will poison your mind and corrupt you to the point where you don't think you love your wife anymore. These little things get a little foothold in your life. It's like a wedge We'll start wedging and prying you guys together. That's why it's important to really, as the Bible says right here, keep thy heart with all diligence for out of, the, out of it are the issues of life. What that's telling us is be careful and guard your heart. What do you think about? Guard your mind. What are you looking at? What are you watching on TV? What are you looking at in magazines? Guard yourself so you don't become exposed to those because out of those things, as you see and as you think and as you feel, come the issues of life. I find myself going back into very dark places, very negative places, very angry places when I get lazy and I just don't want to think. I don't want to guard my heart with all diligence. I'll find my, the default position for the, for the flesh, for the sinful flesh, is to go back to those things that are bad and destructive and ultimately work to undermine our lives and to undermine our marriages. We have to be conscious. We have to be a soldier on a watchtower, constantly looking 
for these things that would creep in. Because the devil will come into our homes and use little things to get a foothold. And once he gets a foothold, he can wreak havoc in our homes. Number five, never retire for the night angry with each other. The Bible says, let not the sun go down upon your wrath. And the Bible says, confess your faults one to another. And the Bible says, forget those things which are behind. And the Bible says, be ye kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. A very good thing. That's something that we have always been very careful, even with the kids, is never, well, no one's going to bed if, if someone is angry. We're going to sit, we're going to talk it out, we're going to sort it out. Doesn't mean we have to come to an agreement. We may disagree, but we're not going to be going to bed angry. Number six. Keep Christ the center of your home. For the Bible says, Except the Lord build the house, thy labor in vain that build it. The Bible says, In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. And the Bible says, And the peace of God which hath passed all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So the statement, Keeping Christ in the center of your home, I think the first scripture verse really sums it up. Except the Lord build the house, Thy labors in vain that build it. When he's talking about building the house, he's talking about our life. The Bible refers to our body as a temple, or as a house, or as a mansion, or as a palace. And what the Bible's telling us is if the Lord doesn't build it, if you don't have the the the, the Christ in your heart directing you and, and directing your life and mind and thoughts and your actions and deeds, what the life that you're building is is a uh, built on a foundation of sand. Pray together. How many couples pray together? Do you pray with your wife? Do you pray with your children? Did Christ not say whenever two or three are gathered together in my name that I am with you as well? I'm in the midst. So do you want to have Christ in your home? Do you want to have his mighty angels encompassing about your home? creating a hedge of protection against the devil that would come in and undermine and destroy our families and our marriage? Yeah, well, of course we want, we want it. So if we want to invite Christ into our homes, we need to pray together. The Bible says, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The Bible says, Pray for one another. And the Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God that giveth to all men liberally. Do you ask God for wisdom? Do you ask God for guidance in the simple things in life, in decisions at work? Maybe you have to make a decision on who uh, you send out on a service call. Let's say you're a manager for a cable company. Do you ask God's wisdom for this thing? Do you ask God as wives, do you ask God's wisdom for to help show you what type of a meal would be pleasing to serve my family and my husband? Do you ask for wisdom when you get up in the morning and you really have something that you want to do, a hobby or golfing or fishing, ask wisdom, is this the best thing for me to do today? Or is there something left undone that, that I could do that would that would that um, I could do for my wife? Taking all these things to God. We don't do that enough. We have not because we ask not. Number eight, agree that divorce is not the answer. The Bible says, what therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. And the Bible says, whoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, commits adultery. And whosoever marries her, which is put away, doth commit adultery as well. And the Bible says, the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband, so long as she lives. So, the Bible is very hard on divorce. And that sits, rubs a lot of people the wrong way. Um, and the reason why the Bible is so hard, hard, on, hard on divorce is because, yes, we don't look upon it with the abhorrence that we should. What's the thing we always say uh, when kids are involved with the divorce? Oh, you know, the kids are okay, or the kids will be fine, or, or, you know, yeah, it's not ideal, but they'll get through it. It's very destructive. Just talk to some kids that have been through it, and talk to them 40, 50, 60 years later, still packing around the, those scars and that damage um, from that divorce. Feeling responsible, many many kids feel that they were the ones that were that brought it about. And had they 
not about, about what I think. I do share my opinions on takes, but those are supplemental to scripture. So this Bible study is a little bit different. Than